So in the previous video, we have learned how glucose enters glycolysis and is oxidized into pyruvate. There are other products that are formed during glycolysis, ATP and NADH. So in this video, we'll learn what happened to the byproducts of glycolysis. As you recall, if we start with one molecule of glucose, we also consume two molecules of ADP, two molecules of inorganic phosphate, and two molecules of NAD+. And we produce two pyruvates, two ATP, and two NADH. So let's try to focus first on what happened to ATP. You probably know that ATP is the main source of energy that cells use to do work because the hydrolysis of ATP is a source of energy that drives forward unfavorable reactions. However, there is a common misconception. Some people say that the hydrolysis of ATP is the most exergonic reaction in a cell. If that was true, of course, ATP could drive many, many endergonic reactions. But there will be no reaction exergonic enough for a molecule to transfer its phosphate to ADP to regenerate ATP. So very quickly, the cell will run out of ATP. So to better understand the central role of ATP, we will use few examples with intermediates of glycolysis. So in this graph, we have positioned the hydrolysis potential of different molecules, starting with phosphoenol pyruvate. It has a very high free energy of hydrolysis with a delta G of minus 60 kilojoule per mole. And at the bottom of the graph, we have glucose 6-phosphate that has a lower free energy of hydrolysis minus 14 kilojoule per mole. And in between, we have ATP with minus 30 kilojoule per mole. So this intermediate place of ATP makes the synthesis of ATP from ADP possible when it's coupled with a reaction that is more exergonic than the synthesis of ATP. For example, the hydrolysis of phosphoenol pyruvate during glycolysis. In contrast, many endergonic reactions can be coupled with the hydrolysis of ATP that will provide enough energy to drive this unfavorable reaction forward. For example, it will be the case of the phosphorylation of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. Let's take a few examples to really understand the central role of ATP. And as you've noticed, I use the term reaction coupling, coupled reaction. What does it mean? So let's take a first example where phosphoenol pyruvate is hydrolyzed into pyruvate plus phosphate. This reaction is highly exergonic. The change of free energy is very negative. In contrast, the synthesis of ATP from ADP plus inorganic phosphate is unfavorable because its change of free energy is positive, plus 30 kilojoule per mole. However, if we combine these two reactions into a single reaction, where phosphoenol pyruvate react with ADP to form pyruvate and ATP. These two reactions share a common reactant, so that's why we can combine them. And the change of free energy for this combined reaction is negative because it is the sum of the change of free energy from the two reactions. Therefore, this combined reaction is thermodynamically favorable and can lead to the synthesis of ATP. So 
the combining of reaction where one energetically unfavorable reaction is driven by another energetically favorable reaction is what is called reaction coupling. So how coupling is made possible? Most commonly, a coupling is achieved when the combined reactions share a common reactant. They have a net change of free energy negative, and they are catalyzed by the same enzyme. So for example, the coupling between the dephosphorylation of phosphoenol pyruvate and the synthesis of ATP is catalyzed by pyruvate kinase, by one single enzyme. Having a shared reactant and a sum of free energy that is negative does not ensure coupling. For example, starting again with the hydrolysis of phosphoenol pyruvate and now introducing a new reaction, the phosphorylation of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate. These two reactions share a common reactant, the inorganic phosphate. The sum of the change of free energy is also negative. However, the cell does not contain any enzyme that can catalyze both of these reactions. As a consequence, these two reactions are not coupled. Let's take a final example to once again emphasize the central role of ATP. The hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate is exergonic with a change of free energy of minus 30 kilojoule per mole. The phosphorylation of glucose into glucose 6-phosphate is endergonic with a change of free energy of plus 14 kilojoule per mole. These two reactions can be combined because they share a common reactant. In this case, the change of free energy of the combined reaction will be negative, minus 16 kilojoule per mole. And an enzyme called hexokinase catalyzes both of these reactions. So the two reactions, the synthesis of glucose 6-phosphate, and the hydrolysis of ATP are coupled. Many unfavorable reactions are coupled with ATP hydrolysis. That is why the core of the cellular metabolism is devoted to the regeneration of ATP. Now, what happened to pyruvate and NADH? We know that glycolysis requires NAD+. And during glycolysis, NAD plus is converted into NADH. If we do not regenerate NAD plus from NADH, glycolysis will stop. The cell has different solutions to regenerate NAD plus, and most of them involve pyruvate. So let us consider the fate of pyruvate under two different conditions. First, in aerobic conditions, pyruvate will be decarboxylated into an acetyl group, and the acetyl group is transferred to coenzyme A to form acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A enters a metabolic pathway called the citric acid cycle, and more NADH in this pathway will be produced. Finally, all the NADH that are produced during the citric acid cycle and during glycolysis will be converted back to NAD plus when NADH transfer its electrons to a group of complexes called the electron transport chain. We'll talk in more detail about this process later in the course. What happened under anaerobic conditions? NAD plus is regenerated by the reduction of pyruvate into lactate or ethanol. These two processes are called fermentation. So we have lactic fermentation and ethanol fermentation. 
Let's start with lactate fermentation. Even if humans are aerobic organisms, in some conditions, some of their tissues function under anaerobic conditions. For example, during intense muscular activity, the muscle needs a lot of ATP. The muscle cannot consume fast enough the oxygen that is delivered to this tissue. And consequently, the muscle will now operate under anaerobic conditions. Glycolysis will be the main source of ATP, and pyruvate will be degraded into lactate in one single reaction, which is catalyzed by the lactate dehydrogenase. And this reaction is coupled with the conversion of NADH into NAD+. Lactate fermentation is also fairly important for human dietary needs. Indeed, this pathway is used by bacteria that contribute to the formation of cheese and yogurt from milk. What about the ethanol fermentation? Ethanol fermentation is a two-step process. In the first step, pyruvate is reduced and decarboxylated into acetaldehyde. This reaction is catalyzed by the pyruvate decarboxylase. Then acetaldehyde will be converted, reduced, into ethanol. And this reaction, catalyzed by the alcohol dehydrogenase, is coupled with the regeneration of NAD+. Does ethanol fermentation also happen in the muscle during intense physical activity? No. Only lactate fermentation happens in the muscle. In fact, a reverse version of ethanol fermentation happens in the liver when the liver degrades ethanol that is consumed by human. Ethanol fermentation is of major commercial, societal, and historical, in some cases even hysterical, consequences. This pathway is used by yeast to produce alcohol during the production of wine and beer. You can also see from the ethanol fermentation pathway that carbon dioxide is produced. This carbon dioxide is responsible for the carbonation of sparkling wines like champagne during their second phase of fermentation. So in conclusion, under anaerobic conditions, fermentation regenerates the NAD plus store. And overall, glycolysis and fermentation together consume one molecule of glucose, two molecules of ADP, two inorganic phosphate, to produce two molecules of ATP, two molecules of water, two molecules of lactate, during lactic fermentation, and two molecules of ethanol, and as well as two molecules of carbon dioxide during ethanol fermentation. In the next set of videos, we will discuss specific examples, including glycolysis in red blood cells.